My name is Jenna Weiss. I'm the manager of public programs. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture by Susanna Heschel, An Exile of the Soul, Jewish Existence in Diaspora. Susanna Heschel is the Eli Black Professor and Chair of the Jewish Studies Program at Dartmouth College. She is the author of Abraham Geiger and the Jewish Jesus, The Aryan Jesus, Christian Theologies and the Bible in Nazi Germany, and Jewish Islam, and has published over 100 articles and edited several books, including Moral Grandeur and Spiritual Audacity, Essays of Abraham Joshua Heschel, Insider, Outsider, American Jews and Multiculturalism, Betrayal, German Churches and the Holocaust, and most recently with Umar Rayad, The Muslim Reception of European Orientalism. Heschel is a Guggenheim Fellow and has held research grants from the Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the National Humanities Center, among others. For full details on all of our upcoming public programs and events, please visit our website to sign up for our e-news. And now, if you can take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Susanna Heschel. Thank you very much, Jenna. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited to speak here at the Jewish Museum. And it's wonderful to be with everybody. And then great that everybody came out, given what's going on. <laughs> I appreciate it. So I'm interested in the question of Jewish understandings of exile. Exile versus diaspora. Exile is understood by Jews through the centuries and of course specifically in the United States. Jews came to the United States and many, if maybe most, actually felt that they had been liberated and often spoke about immigration to the US as an exodus from Egypt. What was Egypt? For them, it was <laughs> Europe. Europe and sometimes for them, European Judaism. But they came to this country and exalted democracy. There was no need in the United States for Jews to win emancipation. They came as equals. And in that sense, America was felt to be a kind of promised land, a land where injustice is intolerable because it is an assault on the democracy that is the promised land for Jews. And Jews came to this country with a great concern about America preserving democracy. And they joined what was a long and strong prophetic tradition in this country. Now when I started thinking about exile, what immediately came to mind was a passage that I had read in graduate school by a rabbi from Venice from the 17th century, Simone Luzzato, Simcha Luzzato. Luzzato's discourse, which he wrote in Italian, sought to explain Judaism to a Christian audience, and it stands as an early manifesto of religious tolerance. And he asked the question, how is it the Jews have survived united through so many different lands of dispersal? And in response, Luzzato compares Jews to a river. And I'm very struck by that association of Jews exile, and rivers. So he writes, for the Jews are scattered around the whole world, like a river running through a long stretch of countryside whose waters receive a coloration from the soils of the various lands through which they pass. This is how the Jews acquire different ways from the nations in which they settle. They have a firmness and inexpressible tenacity in the observance of their faith and a uniformity of dogma regarding their beliefs during the course of 1,550 years of dispersion in the world. This is a remarkable steadfastness, Lutzata writes. Now on the one hand, it's a lovely image. Jews are like a calm river, scattered, flowing, but always retaining their essential nature, whatever the coloration. But of course, we know that Jewish history is not always very calm. And in Lutzato's image, the affect, the passion, the trauma are missing. And so instead, we might turn to the Bible, 
which describes the aftermath of the conquest of the southern kingdom of Judah by the Babylonians in 586 BCE, including the destruction of the temple, the first temple in Jerusalem, and the deportation of the Israelites in chains to Babylonia. And we have Psalm 137, a famous psalm, that captures the jumbled emotions of this trauma of exile. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, raise it, raise it down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, you devastator, happy shall he be who requites you with what you have done to us. Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. And here in this psalm, we hear the voice of rage, despair, humiliation, desire for revenge, the sorrow and yearning. Here, rivers are metaphors for tears. Lutzato describes diaspora, gola, while the psalm depicts exile, galut. And the question is, when does gola become galut? When does diaspora become exile? While many Jews returned from Babylonia to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, most remained in Babylonia, today Iraq, really until the 1990s, probably the longest Jewish settlement outside the land of Israel. The exile from Judah became diaspora in Babylon. Those Babylonian Jews transformed their exile into diaspora and became a flourishing community that lasted for so many centuries, producing the Talmud, the Gaonic literature, medieval Jewish philosophy, modern Jewish literature, and an identity as Arab Jews. On the other hand, diaspora can become exile. And I want to tell you, some years ago when I was studying in Berlin, a friend took me to an exhibit in the area called Kreuzberg. Maybe some of you have been to Berlin? Yeah? So this was a small exhibit that was called Aus Nachbarn wurden Juden. Out of neighbors, they became Jews. They were neighbors. And then one day, after 33, they became Jews. That is, after 1933, diaspora became exile, and then, of course, death. And that, of course, is the question that worries many of us today. Is our current diaspora becoming exile as antisemitism escalates around the world? Destruction, of course, came again to the Jews, though not really exile. When the Romans destroyed the Jerusalem temple in the year 70 CE, actually Jews were not exiled from the land of Israel. Some continued to live there. They produced the Palestinian Talmud, though most Jews at that point were already living in diaspora throughout Asia Minor, North Africa, and the Levant. But the trauma of the destruction of 70 needed a theological interpretation especially since this time the Jews were not allowed to rebuild the temple that the Romans destroyed. After 70 CE, Jews did not live with any sovereignty. We lived without sovereignty until 1948 and the establishment of the State of Israel. Biblical religion in this diaspora in Babylonia turned into rabbinic Judaism. Exile, galut, became diaspora, though at many times during the course of Jewish history with persecutions, expulsions, and murder, diaspora turned back into galut, into exile. So my lecture tonight 
We'll examine some Jewish understandings and interpretations. What are the directions we take with this problem of exile and diaspora? How does it affect us, not just politically, but how does it affect us as Jews existentially, theologically? And I want to look briefly, by comparison, at the understanding of exile among Muslims and Christians as well. Jews created Judaism in this exile. And my concluding concern is whether the experience of a state of exile can ever be fully overcome. We seem to feel that way in the United States, but I want to return to that at the end. But I also want to talk about Zionism, which claims to bring us out of exile, and ask whether the experience of living in a state of exile can ever be fully overcome. Can Zionism really bring us out of exile? Or is Zionism, too, inevitably, another form of existential or theological exile? Are Jews, by definition, bound to live in exile? And if so, what is our responsibility as a people in exile, of exile? And this is not only a political question, but it's a question about whether we have an ethical mandate as a people of exile. In 1950, David Ben-Gurion made a deal with Jacob Blaustein. You know who is Ben-Gurion. Jacob Blaustein was an American industrialist and president of the American Jewish Committee. The deal was this. They agreed that Jews in America were not in Galut, in exile, but in Gola, in diaspora. As a multicultural country, the United States was welcoming, and Jews were flourishing. Galut, exile, means awaiting God's redemption. But this kind of theology was remote to most American Jews, and they didn't feel they were in Galut. Blaustein was certainly not about to pack up and move to Israel. That's 1950. Ten years later, in 1960, David Ben-Gurion reneged on the deal. He gave a speech to the World Jewish Congress in which he warned that in America, quote, Judaism faces death by a kiss, a slow and imperceptible decline into the abyss of assimilation. Now, Ben-Gurion used to say, that the biggest challenge to the state of Israel is a robust, happy Jewish community outside of Israel. Who's going to want to make Aliyah to move to Israel if they're happy where they are? Before the Shoah, before the Holocaust, the ingathering of the exiled Jews that was promised by Zionism faltered when America and Europe seemed to be a safe gola. Now, this wasn't really new. In the 17th century, in Safed, Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz, also known as the Shla from the title of his book, Shnei Luchot Abrit, he wrote, when I saw in this world the children of Israel building for their own use houses like princely palaces, building permanent houses made of stones in a land of impurity, it was as if they had renounced redemption. We have to live in exile, or we abandon the idea that we require redemption. Now, the catastrophe of the year 70, <clears throat> the destruction of the temple, certainly required explanation. But Judaism also had to continue. We needed a balance between mourning on the one hand, and on the other hand, continuing. The, de the destruction was devastating, but it couldn't be the final word. But there was a complication, and that is that in the same century that the temple was destroyed, Christianity arose. And Christians quickly developed an explanation for the destruction that was geared to their own self-justification. The New Testament conflates the death of Jesus with the destruction of the temple. So the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, writes that at the moment of the death of Jesus, quote, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And it's striking that this is mirrored in a passage in the Talmud in Gittin 56. There are some early Christian texts that claim that Jesus himself destroyed the temple. And the claim went out in Christian sources that the catastrophe was God punishing the Jews for crucifying Jesus and rejecting Christianity, and that it was a fulfillment of biblical warnings. Jews were punished with exile, exiled from the land of Israel, and forced to wander the earth to demonstrate the superiority of Christianity. By contrast, Jewish texts, for example, the Book of Esther, or the first century writings of the Jewish philosopher Philo, or the Jewish historian Josephus, all refer to diaspora positively, even as a blessing, that we live in Galut, not diaspora, in exile and not diaspora, that idea begins to appear in Jewish texts around the fifth century in response to Christian polemics, argues the historian Israel Yuval. According to Christians, the Jews' exile is a punishment by God for killing Jesus. According to Jewish understanding, Jews are indeed in exile, but as a self-sacrificial atonement for the sins of all human beings. Now, just to not um, keep this entirely theological, there is a political element as well. For Jews to claim that the Romans had exiled the Jews from the land of Israel also had helpful legal implications. By arguing the Jews had gone into exile as a result of 70 CE, medieval Jews could claim ancient legal rights allegedly bestowed by Titus or Vespasian. Moreover, Jews in Christian lands could present their community as a kilah as a holy community, a local embodiment of ancient Jerusalem. And exile was not understood, of course, as a permanent state. It was anticipatory, pre-Messianic. And this is concretized in daily prayers. The evening service opens with Psalm 78 and 20. Uh, uh, that uh, he, God, being full of compassion, forgives iniquity. Save, Lord, the king will answer us on the day when we call. The anticipation of messianic redemption is always present. What interests me, and I have to say, I was thinking about this a lot on Yom Kippur, we always say in Yom Kippur so often, because of our sins, because of our sins, we were exiled from our land. And I started wondering, what does it do to us as individuals to be saying that so often? Because of our sins, we were exiled from our land. There's a way in which exile is understood also as something very personal and as something existential, in fact. It becomes exile, an individual existential experience for Jews. And it's reinforced in the liturgy. It's not only negative, though, as a punishment for sin. It can also be positive. And that I find striking. So for instance, in the Bible, God commands Abraham to leave his land, his home, his family, to travel to the promised land of Israel and find his home there. And in the Hasidic commentary, the Kedushas Levi of Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev, he interprets the command of God, lech lecha. What does it mean? God could just say lech. What's the lecha? Lech lecha. What does that mean? He interprets it as go inward. Go inside yourself. Go inward to find and overcome the exile that lives within you. The Kotzka Rebbe, another Hasidic Rebbe, talks about the importance of authenticity. You can't be Jewish like other people are Jewish. Your Judaism has to be authentic to who you are. But that means that you have to know who you are. You have to look inside yourself and first know who you are before you can really be an authentic Jew. To be a Jew like other people are Jewish that my father called spiritual plagiarism. <laughs> that my, Abraham, my father was Abraham Heschel, by the way. As an existential 
state, an inner state, galut, exile, means yearning, yearning for redemption and prayer, which is opening one's soul to God in the deepest possible vulnerability, gives voice to that yearning. Now, for Christians and Muslims, there is no geographic single location from which they have been exiled, as there is for Jews. Neither Mecca nor Rome function in the same way in Islam and Christianity, the way Jerusalem functions for Jews theologically and liturgically, though Jerusalem may be holy to all three. But still, the sense of homelessness, of yearning for God, is shared, sometimes based on the same biblical texts especially the paradigmatic exodus from Egypt that begins a period of wandering and homelessness. There is a hadith that says, leaving one's homeland is punishment. But a scholar at University of Chicago, Wadad al-Qadi, writes that a sense of alienation is praised in early Islamic texts. It's a sign of integrity, nobility, maturity, morality, wisdom, gentility of spirit, consideration, compassion, character, integrity. And it's linked to fitra, to the state of innocence in which all human beings are born. Homelessness can have a positive meaning. After the death and resurrection of Christ proclaimed in Christianity and reported in the Gospels, of course came the belief that Christ will return one day, fundamental to Christianity. I might borrow here a term from the psychoanalyst James Strachey and call the death of Jesus the point of urgency for mutative interpretation for Christians. That means that the moment came when the death of the Savior, catastrophe, turned into a longing for the second coming, for the parousia. Jesus' death was Christ's diaspora from his body. And Christians who call themselves lost sheep are now in limbo, waiting for his redemptive return. Now in classic Jewish theology, where is God when we are in exile? Jews are never alone in exile. And this is distinctive in Jewish theology. God is in exile with us and also requires redemption, as do we. This is an idea that's expressed in texts from the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Midrash, and fully developed, of course, in medieval Kabbalistic literature and Hasidic literature. In the Talmud Megillah 29, it says, in every exile into which the children of Israel went, the Shekhinah, God's presence, was with them. There's a Mishnah in, in Sukkah. Ani vaho hoshiana. It starts out by saying on Sukkot, on Hashanah Rabbah, we say, Ana Hashem hoshiana, God redeem us. But then the Mishnah adds, Ani vaho hoshiana. What does that mean? I and ho should be redeemed? Who's ho? Well, the Talmud says in Shabbat 104 that Ho is a designation for the Kaddish Borahu, for God, meaning that the phrase is saying, I and God, please redeem. Let me tell you, you know in Passover and the God we have four sons. Everybody's familiar with this, right? The wise son, wicked son, simple son, one who doesn't ask a question. Everybody familiar? What's the difference between the wise son and the wicked son? Do you know? Do you ever notice? What, you ever ask why? What is it with the wicked? What did he do that's so terrible? Can someone tell me? What did he say that's so terrible? Yes, go ahead. He asked, what does it mean to you? Very good. What does this mean to you? Okay, fine. That's wicked. Okay, what's wise? What does the wise one ask? What's the pronoun? Edchem. Edchem. The wise says, to you, and the wicked says, lachem, to you. To you, to you. What, so what's wicked about the wicked? Actually, there's a commentary. I'm just telling you this so you can. The problem with the wicked, what makes him wicked is he says, ma ha'avodah azod lachem, lachem velo lo. Kshaw tzirat zmo menaklal, 
Kofarbikar. He says, what is this worship to you? To you and not to him. <clears throat> Who's the him? The common interpretation is he's saying to you and not to him, meaning not to himself. But you know, keep in mind the narrative voice. Who's speaking there? He says, what is this to you? And then somebody else is saying, oh, he said to you, and he didn't say to him. But the commentary says what he means is to you and not to the Kaddish Baruch Hu, not to God. Did he, did he take himself out from the community or is he removing God from the need for redemption? What makes him wicked, in other words, is that he thinks only human beings need redemption. He doesn't recognize that God too needs redemption because what place is there for God in a world of wickedness? Okay, I happen to think it's a beautiful commentary, but coming back to my lecture. The exile of Israel in Jewish theology and the exile of the soul from its original home fused in Kabbalah with the idea of the exile of the Shekhinah, of God's presence. Exile means that a part of God is also exiled from a part of God, the female from the male, and awaits reunion and redemption. And that's why before saying a prayer, there's a meditation that appears in many prayer books that says, for the sake of the reunion of the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the masculine transcendent aspect of God, with the Shekhinah, the feminine imminent presence of God, May my prayers redeem God from exile. So exile is not only something political, it's something deeply ingrained in each individual Jew, and it's highly, highly theological. Now Jews have worried always about what happens to Judaism in diaspora. Will it be contaminated and changed and altered? And at the same time, we all know that Jews have incorporated, polemicized, and adopted key elements of Christian practice, of Islamic beliefs into Judaism. In fact, the Passover Seder is less of a Greek symposium than it is a kind of Christian Eucharist, writes the Israeli historian Yisrael Yuval. And belief in divine omnipotence and God being transcendent far away, that entered Judaism from Islam. My father writes, the Jewish principle has been that if non-Jewish neighbors are pious in their faith, Jews will be pious in our faith. But then the Psalm reminds us, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Yes, Judaism has been called a portable homeland, and that's meant that rabbinic concern, the Talmud, has been less about observing the mitzvot, the commandments in diaspora, then the dangers of improper observance of the commandments within the land of Israel. And so let's look at a passage in the Talmud. One should always, this is from Ketubot 110, one should always live in the land of Israel, even in a town most of whose inhabitants are idolaters, but let no one live outside the land even in a town most of whose inhabitants are Israelites. For whoever lives in the land of Israel may be considered to have a God, but whoever lives outside the land may be regarded as one who has no God. A strong statement, but let's keep in mind that the rabbis who wrote this were themselves living comfortably in Babylonia. Can it really be better to live in an idolatrous city in Israel rather than in Galut, in diaspora, somewhere else? Maimonides rejected this, recognizing that God is present in all countries, just as the Quran affirms that Allah is everywhere. And note that on the very next page of the Talmud, Rabbi Yehuda warns, quote, anyone who ascends from Babylonia to the land of Israel transgresses a positive mitzvah 
as it is stated, and he quotes from Jeremiah, they shall be taken to Babylonia, and there they shall remain until the day that I recall them, said the Lord. We have a conflict. Not only is it forbidden to hasten the coming of the Messiah, but improperly observing the commandments in Israel may actually prolong exile. In the 13th century, Rabbi Meir of Rothenburg, born in Worms, today Germany, wrote, for if one sins in the land of Israel, he will be punished more severely than for sins committed in diaspora, because God nurtures the land always. For the land regurgitates sinners, and therefore the land is desolate now. But one who goes for the sake of heaven and conducts himself in holiness and piety there is no end to his reward, provided he can support himself there in the land of Israel. <laughs> what we see is an interesting split, and it continues to this day. The medieval Tosafists, many of whom went to Israel in the great Aliyah of 1211, felt that it was important to live in the land of Israel and observe those commandments that are tied to the land and can only be observed in the land of Israel. But there were others who stayed home back in Ashkenaz because observing the mitzvot in Israel improperly, that is without full devotion, would actually cause even greater problems than remaining in diaspora and not observing so well. You see the conflict? The irony is that the return from exile to the land would lead to an even greater exile, living in the land of Israel, but in a state of exile. Like the biblical Israelites who left Egypt, they left Egypt, they left slavery, but what happened? Then they entered the exile of the wilderness. What do we learn? Exile is not overcome simply by liberation not by liberation even from slavery. Moving from Ashkenaz to Israel, or today with freedom from Jim Crow laws. Exile remains the haunting specter of being a Jew, a defining element of Jewish law, Jewish theology, and Jewish identity. And so I am differing here from the political scientist Michael Walzer, who argues that the nation is formed out of a remembrance of oppression and liberation. I see Jews constructing Judaism, God, and their own identity as a state of exile, from which liberation brings only a new expression of exile, not a redemption from it, from slavery in Egypt to wandering in the wilderness. Today, in the 20th century, we have the Satma Rebbe in his, the previous Satma Rebbe in his book, Vayol Moshe, who opposed Zionism, warning that the mitzvot, the commandments, are more highly charged in the land of Israel, so that performing them incorrectly without devotion, proper kavanah dvekut, would be destructive in heaven and hinder the coming of the Messiah. That is, a religious life in exile can be more holy than a religious life that lacks the intense devotion to God that is required by living in the land of Israel. There is a higher level of demand. How to live a holy life, that's the issue. Where we live is secondary, but to live in Israel demands the highest level of religious intensity. If we're in diaspora and we don't have our own Jewish sovereignty, how do we relate to the sovereign of the land? So we have business law, property law, and the Talmud states that we're governed by the law of the land. Dina Mahuta Dina, everybody knows this principle. Fine. The ruler has the authority to collect taxes, to regulate possession and transfer of land. It's actually only mentioned four times in the Babylonian Talmud and not at all in the Palestinian Talmud. But the applicability was developed during the Middle Ages. The law of the land is the law. But there's another principle that's not as well known that I want to mention, and that's chamsanuta de melech, the robbery by the king, that makes a distinction between valid law 
and the arbitrary act of a ruler. And I feel that this is something that has a lot of relevance today. If a sovereign behaves in accordance with the law, Jews adhere to the principle, the law of the land is the law, dina mahutadina. But if the sovereign acts illegally or immorally, it is gzele de mahuta, literally, robbery by the kingdom. So that the principle of dina de mahutadina, the law of the land is the law, was not only one of accommodation, but also one of resistance. That means if a sovereign behaves immorally, let's say by seizing a piece of property that belongs to someone that the sovereign has no right to. Let's say that happens. And let's say some years later, generations later, that piece of property goes up for sale. And a Jew has the opportunity to purchase it. It's forbidden. It's forbidden. No Jew is permitted to benefit to benefit from an illegal or immoral act by the sovereign. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the point is that in the Talmud, rabbinic Jews were taught not simply to accommodate or accept the law of the land. Jews are also legally bound to resist unjust acts and never benefit from them. And by the way, there's a 13th century famous compilation of German law, the Sachsenspiegel, that similarly declares, quote, a man must resist his king and his judge if he does wrong, and must hinder him in every way, even if he be his relative or feudal lord, and he does not thereby break his fealty if the sovereign acts immorally. These are good principles for us today for those of us who were living in countries with leaders who were engaged in immoral and even heinous acts against citizens, refugees, immigrants, and against the laws of the land. Now I want to turn to my last part of my talk. I want to talk a little bit about the emotions of exile. And I'm going to bring us up to the United States. Exile may enhance our passion for the land, the land of Israel for us, in ways that are somatic, bodily, as well as emotional. So for example, verse 5 of Psalm 137 that I played earlier, if I forget you, Jerusalem, let my tongue be cut off. It's somatic, the longing, my body. And it's proclaimed by the groom at the conclusion of many Jewish weddings, just before he smashes the glass, which is itself probably a reminder of the destruction of the temple and the exile from the land of Israel. Some say it's a symbolic breaking of his new wife's hymen. Sometimes I wonder, has he married her or the land? But OK. <laughs> Diaspora involves immersion in foreignness. There is no neutral or isolated diasporic space. There's Christian, Muslim, Jewish space. The land of Israel sometimes feels like the wife, and sometimes we in diaspora are the wife of the land. But diaspora offers its own tease of erotic possibilities. In the imagination, the exile redemption paradigm reflects Edward Said's Orientalist gaze that oscillates between the erotic and the repugnant, a longing for redemption, but also a longing for galut, for exile. There is the cosmopolitan realm of the Gentile, a kind of siren of the forbidden female. Galut entices the Jewish man with an offer of freedom from constraints of all kinds and from the demand of the land to return home. Galut, for some, is kind of like the id of Judaism, as expressed, for example, in the writings of Chernochovsky or Berdachevsky, a rebellion against the constraints of the law, whereas Zionism demands solidarity with our fellow Jews, building and defending the state like a man. And many of us live in both realms, and for some of us, it is not the homeland that creates the diaspora, but the diaspora that creates the imagined homeland. Overcoming the diaspora, lehit gaber in Hebrew, also literally means becoming a man. And so we can ask, is there room for women? 
What would a feminist Zionism look like? Galut may create the homeland, but the homeland can also be a place of Galut. The Tosafists warned, the medieval Ashkenazi rabbis warned that we cannot easily extricate ourselves from Galut simply by moving to Israel. In fact, my father said once in a speech to the World Zionist Organization that in certain ways, Zionism can also be a Galut as a rejection of Jewish religious sensibilities and the ethical passion refined during 2,000 years of Galut. He said, vulgarity in the synagogue is galut. There's some bar mitzvah parties that are galut. <laughs> and the celebration of Israel's Independence Day with parades of tanks and guns and fighter jets through the streets of Jerusalem, that's also galut. It demonstrates how difficult it is for us to leave galut because that kind of galut is in us. The problem we face today is not so much the negation of the diaspora, but Zionism's galut from the spirit of galut Judaism and its teachings. And we in diaspora have the same problem. Is it ever possible to leave the state of exile? Daniel Boyarin has described the Talmud as Judaism's portable homeland, and along with others, he's reclaimed diaspora as the answer to nationalism. Hanan Hever, who teaches Hebrew literature at Yale, has called attention to alternative Zionist traditions that imagine a binational Jewish and Palestinian state that resists the exclusionary political theological format. But I really wonder, can a text really bring us out of homelessness and exile and overcome eg the exile that's been ingrained for 2,000 years of Jewish prayer? The melancholy of exile may be so deeply ingrained that it is unclear if the Talmud, diaspora, or binationalism can be the antidote. I quote here from a poem by Mahmoud Darwish, Palestinian poet. Who am I without exile, he asks. A stranger on the riverbank, like the river, water binds me to your name. What will we do without exile, he asks. And indeed, is there a way to escape exile? We would be wrong to think of exile as a state of emptiness. Exile is a condition of the mind and soul, as well as the body's physical location, and it becomes an identity filled with passion. Galut Judaism, I want to argue, is a mandate. It's an ethical imperative. It's not just a political problem of sovereignty and anti-Semitism. It is that, but it's more. What kind of figure is the diasporic person? Political, certainly, and unable to participate in the nation state, and perhaps precisely for that reason, also an ethical figure. And so I turn to Abdul Kabir Khatibi, a Moroccan writer, who asks about the ethics of transcultural encounter. If national identity is tied to language, is there a transnational, multilingual, polyglossic diaspora? Yiddish in Hebrew, Ladino in Hebrew, Arabic in Hebrew. Khatibi describes the forms of desire that occur in the diasporic, multilingual condition. The shifting languages become tattooed in his memory, he writes, and language becomes a somatic condition of pleasure. I dreamt the other night that my body was made of words, he writes. The linguistic shifts of diasporic existence are not just cognitive, but also corporeal, not just geographic, but also spiritual. Transnationalism gives rise to a special sense of responsibility by blurring and even transcending the boundaries that define identity, national, geographic, linguistic, religious. But visuality also transcends the national, offering expression that is universal. And I turn now to the work of Louise Fishman, the artist who was with us here this evening and whose work is included in the permanent exhibit at the Jewish Museum. In the case of Lu the artist Louise Fishman, 
I might say, echoing Abdul Kabir Khatibi. It's not that her body is made of words, but I would say that her soul is made of images. She traveled in 1988 to the death camps of Eastern Europe and created a series of extraordinary paintings when she returned that are collectively entitled Remembrance and Renewal. Her paintings include some of the soil she gathered from the pond of living ashes at Auschwitz. And she recalls in a conversation with Elaine Posner that, quote, when I used the wax and ashes, it felt like I had company in the studio. I had these voices with me and I could paint. What is striking is that she gave each painting a title drawn from the Passover Seder, Haggadah, Bitter Herb, Dayenu, Karpas. The remembrance of the exodus from slavery becomes memorial to those who died and also a testament to those who survive. Louise Fishman's art is infused with her personal experience, with her understanding of Jewish experience, and also with her passions. In 1973, she painted Angry Louise, and as Ingrid Schaffner writes in the conversation with Louise Fishman about the golem, quote, your anger is material, one that has never been fully transformed by alchemy or anything supernatural, but rather has been annealed by your art. To anneal is to burn, to make a substance stronger by making it softer, less brittle. To be in your studio, no, it's the work that's on fire, not you. The ultimate challenge to all humanity is the Shoah, the Holocaust. Diaspora turned into exile and ultimately to murder. We have not yet determined a way to give religious expression to its horror. Exile brings us back to the Exodus, recreated at Passover, so that we feel not simply as freed from slavery, but as if each of us, each of us is a slave going forth from Egypt into the exile of wilderness. Perhaps the diasporic Jew may today be reconfigured, and here I conclude, may be reconfigured as ethical and disruptive of nationalism's exclusionary politics. The exile is a herald of disruptive politics, writes Dominic Lacapra, a politics that challenges the rigidity and dichotomy of identity politics and favors empathy, partnership, joint dwelling, and integration instead of separation, segregation, and depressive mutilation and assimilation. An exilic consciousness, what is our consciousness if exile is something individual and existential for each of us? It's not something that can be eradicated by a nation state, an army, or even political sovereignty. A deeply ingrained exile may offer the possibility of an ethics of transcultural encounter. Galut Judaism, Judaism in exile, has meant 2,000 years of Jewish history, theology, and religious practices that have cultivated an intense devotion to ethical principles of justice, not only for Jews, but for all human beings, as well as a Jewish sensibility concerning an overriding value of human life, a delicacy and refinement in religious observance, and a passion for study and intellectual growth. The diasporic person is never at home, meaning never content or complacent in a world of injustice. The prophet is a diasporic exemplar, leaving home and journeying to the urban seat of the political, military, and economic power to demand an end to corruption, exploitation, cruelty, and indifference. To retain a taste of exile is to retain a passion for justice. Now, while Jews stand as models of how to preserve identity in diaspora and reclaim our homeland, for African Americans whose time in exile was enslavement, torture, rape, followed by Jim Crow, segregation, 
mass incarceration, murder by police, America as homeland is hardly a refuge, and as a diaspora, it's terribly fraught. For African American Jews, the problem has even greater complexity. Jews arrived in the United States with a sense that they had left Egypt and achieved liberation. A synagogue was dedicated in Charleston, South Carolina in 1841 by Gustav Poznanski. And he proclaimed at the dedication, this country is our Palestine. This city, our Jerusalem. This house of God, our temple. Poznanski spoke these words in a slaveholding state and a slaveholding, slave trading city. Yet for him, the other was Europe and European Judaism, oppressive, backward, and authoritarian, while America was the land of freedom. Rabbi Samuel Adler, reform rabbi, arrived in New York from Germany in 1857 and was equally unconcerned with the slavery in America and also compared Europe to Egypt, America to freedom. Quote, behind us lies Egypt, the Middle Ages, before us, the sea of Talmudic legalism, the spirit indwelling here in the West, the spirit of freedom is the newly born Messiah. Of course, for black slaves, America was Egypt, the enslaver of the black Israel. The freed slave Frederick Douglass, in an address he delivered on the 4th of July in 1852, entitled, What to the Slave is the 4th of July? Quoted Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon, and he said, fellow citizens above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth to forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason, most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. Returning finally to the image offered by Simone Luzzato from the 17th century, who compared Jews to a river passing through changing sediments, the water changing colors, we cannot simply celebrate America as the land of freedom and liberty and ignore its history of slavery and the ongoing aftermath. We who know what exile means, that it is not simply somewhere else geographic, but very deeply individual and existential. We who know this have to understand the aftermath of what it means for slavery and what it means to regard this preciousness of democracy in this country as something that is a personal obligation. We can't simply celebrate America and ignore the history. To do so is to be in exile from Judaism, to be merely a squatter in America and not a presence. The river of our exile of our presence in America is colored dark with the horrors of slavery and racism. And for that reason, I want to end with a very moving poem by the great African-American poet Langston Hughes, one of his earliest that also speaks for Jews. It's called The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, 
ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS. Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.